Hey, welcome everybody. We'll let a few more people join the room before we get started. And Caroline, we should be live on Facebook. Yes, we are. Excellent. Then we will get started. We have a um, 32 people in the room right now and everybody joining us on Facebook as well. So welcome everybody to the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets 90 Days Around the World events. As you know, we've been hosting these for the last couple months. Um, they are in as a temporary replacement to two large events we host each year. We generally have the Distillers Showcase, which is a spirit showcase in November, and also our Winter Wine Spectacular, which is normally just 10 days from now in January in New Hampshire. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't do the live events this year, so we are hosting a lot of our guests virtually, and we're very pleased that they were able to join us this year, so thank you so much. Tonight, we have Steve Lohr of J. Lohr, and we have a great conversation about three of their wines, as well as a little bit of history about the vineyard and Steve and the family. So, Steve, welcome to our event tonight. Hey, Sean. Thanks so much. It's great to be with all of you. And I'll let you take it. I know you have an introduction you'd like to do, so I'll let you take it in terms of start talking about Jay Lore and entertaining us with all that wonderful information. Yeah, absolutely. You bet, Sean. Well, welcome, everybody. It's great to have you with us here, and welcome to Jay Lore Vineyards and Wines. So um, some of you may wonder, well, how do we get started, and who is this Jay? Well, Jay is Jerry. That's my dad, and dad grew up in South Dakota. Yeah, in fact, he grew up on a farm there uh, with corn and sorghum and wheat, um, millet and cattle, as well as a bunch of other grains too. And we still have that family farm back there. But uh, he came out to uh, California in the late 50s, uh, met mom in graduate school at Stanford, and then started to go ahead with uh, not wine growing, but custom home building. Uh, Dad was a civil engineer in college. Um, I also studied civil engineering and economics, um, also went to Stanford. Um, but back in the uh, 60s, when he was starting to build uh, custom homes in what would become um, Silicon Valley, it wasn't known as Silicon Valley back then, but it's the South Bay of San Francisco Bay. And um, at that time, if you can imagine, uh, he would go ahead and submit plans for a building permit. It would take about 20 minutes. Basically, put the plans over the counter, get it all stamped off, and then he can just take them and go ahead and start building. Well, 20 minutes uh, very soon went to about two weeks and then two months. This is the time the environmental movement was starting to move into California in the mid to late 60s. And uh, not that that's a problem at all because we think of ourselves as environmentalists too. But uh, you know, today we laugh because two months to, getting, to get a building permit, my gosh, it'll take two years now to get a building permit in many cases. Um, but the thought was, is you take a look at how much longer it was taking to do business and construction, why not diversify? And rather than plant more corn and wheat and stuff, the stuff he grew up with in South Dakota, what was the ultimate um, farming here in California? Well, it was grape growing. And so <clears throat> in 19... 72, he and his building partner, Bernie Turgeon, um, bought 280 acres down in Greenfield in Monterey County. So Monterey County is just a few hours south of San Francisco, um, about uh, two and a half hours to be precise. And the thought was, well, we would still continue building, um, but let's go ahead and try this, this farming thing. After all, uh, dad, having grown up on a farm, he knew how to grow things. Uh, his building partner, Bernie Turgeon, was French Canadian. He knew how to drink things. So it was a perfect combination. And um, at the time, we uh, knew certain grapes like Chardonnay and Riesling were doing well. 
because there were some other families down in our neck of the woods, namely the Mirasus and the Wentes, and they were doing great Chardonnay as well. But we wanted to go ahead and plant Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, grapes that, you know, we take for granted today, but, you know, were actually somewhat popular back in the early 70s, but not nearly as much as they are today. When it all came down to, we planted 11 different varieties of grapes. Um, some of them did really well, like the Chardonnay, Riesling, um, Pinot Blanc, and Valdiguier, which is a very rare French red, which we still make today. But the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Merlot, these other grapes that some professors said, hey, go ahead and plant Maybe a little cool in your area of Monterey, but you should get some good color and flavor. Well, that was the extent of uh, grape growing knowledge in, in the early 70s. Even up in Napa Valley, people were planting um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay side by side. But if you were to take a look at France, you know that Dijon up here in northeastern France is quite a ways away from uh, where the Cabernet Sauvignon is grown in, in Bordeaux. There's hundreds of kilometers uh, difference there. They like completely different climates. It just took us several years to realize how different that was. So after about five years, we went ahead and um, grafted over those 11 varieties of grapes, including Petit Syrah and others, to those four that I mentioned earlier that did really well. And uh, with that, um, Josh, if you would go ahead and pull up a slide here, I'd like to share with folks a few things. So this just happens to be a picture of one of our vineyards in, in Pas Robles, uh, which came later down the line, but we actually got started in, in Monterey County. And when it comes to J. Lore, we think of three words, family, place, and craft. And uh, next, Josh, is a um, picture of the family. So there you have it. Uh, there's Jerry, hence the J in J. Lore. He's the guy sitting behind the wheel, very apropos. Dad's 84 uh, as of two weeks ago and uh, still very active in the vineyards and winery. You were so blessed to still have him with us. Um, to his right, our left, as we look at the screen, is my sister Cynthia, uh, who is our chief brand officer. On the other side of dad is Brother Lawrence, who is our Chief Operating Officer of the Vineyards, and of course me, uh, CEO of, of our winery. And then when we think of family, we don't just think of Lore family, we think of our extended family. Uh, we actually have over 200 employees in our winery altogether, and about another 60 full-time in our vineyards. Um, but meet some of the other parts of our family, our winemakers. So the fellow in the off-white shirt there, that's Jeff Meyer. Uh, he is in his 37th vintage with us. Uh, just a fantastic guy. He's our president and chief operating officer of the uh, winery. Uh, to our right, uh, the tall guy there, that's Steve Peck. Uh, Steve Peck is our director of winemaking. Um, so Jeff, who is also a winemaker, gave up reins to um, Steve just a couple years ago for uh, making wine. And in turn, Steve oversees our two other winemakers, namely Kristen Barnheisel, the woman in the center there. Kristen is our winemaker of white wines. So everything that's white is in Kristen's bailiwick and to um, the left of Kristen is Brennan Wood, who is our red winemaker. So we're really, proud to have a great group of folks. I could show another picture here of all of our vineyard managers, um, some of whom have been with us over 30 years as well. So we're really blessed to have a great uh, group of folks here with us with some long tenures. Okay, next please. All right, so let's take a look at California geography. Um, so California here, um, I understand that many of your other um, episodes have been with our brethren up in the North Coast, Napa Valley and Sonoma and everything, great wine growing areas as well. Um, we happen to have the majority of our vineyards on the Central Coast. 
which actually starts just south of San Francisco and goes all the way down to Santa Barbara, just north of Los Angeles. So it's a really big area. Um, if you take a look at the inset there, you'll see uh, we are headquartered at our San Jose Wine Center. Uh, just so happens that Silicon Valley, um, you know, when I graduated from Stanford, I kept on building as well. And I actually had a dual career, both building custom homes as well as grape growing. And then in 2003, um, uh, wrapped up our building business to go full time in the grapes and wines. So we purchased the old Falstaff Brewery here in downtown San Jose, 1974 and turned it into a winery. And from 74 until 88, we made all of our wines, both red and white, right here in San Jose. Um, but as I mentioned, we first started planting in 72 down in Monterey County in the Arroyo Seco Appalachian that you see there. And in fact, <clears throat> to the left is a picture of, um, of the family. Dad's missing because he's actually taking the picture, but you have mom there. Um, Cynthia Lawrence, uh, he's in the Oshkosh Bagosh, little overalls there, so cute. And then uh, me, um, we've got a picture of uh, some of our very first grapevines there. So this is kind of like our little nursery, the baby grapevines from where the whole j uh started was, was right here. And um, then uh, we'll also talk about Paso Robles today. Um, Paso Robles is in the area an hour south of Monterey County. Um, but before we went down to Paso, in about five years into um, deciding what the heck are we going to do with this Cabernet in, in Monterey that we can't really get fully right, uh, we decided, well, let's, let's take a look at Napa Valley. And in 1984, we purchased a gem of a vineyard right on the Silverado Trail. And we named it after mom, so it's called Carol's Vineyard. We still make a Cabernet Sauvignon blended with the Tiber Doe from that vineyard today. Um, but at the same time, back in 84, we didn't want to be a um, little fish in the big pond that was in Napa. And quite frankly, uh, we've been tasting some of the great Cabernet coming out of Paso, which was a fairly new region at that time. And so in 88, uh, 87, 88, we started planting our first vineyards in Paso. Uh, next, please. Okay, so let's talk about some of the unique geography of Monterey County because it's an area unlike any other. Um, so we start off on the left-hand side there, that's the Pacific Ocean. And you see where it says Monterey, and all of a sudden it looks like the ocean's dropping off. That's because it really does. Uh, you can go just a few miles out from Monterey and already you are a mile deep in the water. Uh, affectionately, we call that area the Blue Grand Canyon because the ocean is as deep there, just a few miles offshore, as the Grand Canyon is deep. Well, you may say, how does that affect grapes? Well, it's very, very important because when you have that depth of water, the water stays really cold. And as a result, um, when the sun hits the Great Central Valley um, of California, which would be just up and over the mountains there, um, as you're looking towards the upper right part of your screen, as the sun hits that area, it warms up the soil, and then as the soil warms up, the air above it warms up, and of course, warm air rises. Well, as that warm air rises, what it does is it, pull, it makes a vacuum, and it pulls in the cool air from the ocean. That's what San Francisco, that's what Mark Twain said about San Francisco. He said, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And for those of you who've been to the city, you know that fog is such an important part of, um, of San Francisco. So come visit us in December and January. You'll, you'll love the city. Actually, come anytime. It's, it's a great city. But um, the same fog that comes in through the Golden Gate Bridge there also comes down our valley. And in particular, it creates what we refer to as a thermal rainbow. 
So as you look at the little temperature gauge here, this is at three o'clock. Um, and normally that'd be about the warmest part of the day in the Salinas Valley here. Um, so you see Salinas itself where a lot of great lettuce and other vegetable crops are, is grown, are grown. Uh, that's staying fairly cool there in purple. And then as you go southeast through Gonzales and Soledad, you see it's getting blue. By the time you get to Greenfield, we're starting to get literally almost green. It's uh, warming up a little bit there, but a warm day for us in Monterey County in our area. And we have vineyards where you see the red um, uh, areas there. Those are our vineyards in the Arroyo Seco and the Santa Lucia Highlands AVA. Um, those areas will, on a warm day, only go up to about 80 degrees. And that's so important for growing world-class Chardonnay because you're just not gonna get great Chardonnay when it's consistently over 90 degrees. Uh, you just lose a lot of the, the nice fruit flavors. And then as you go further southeast down the valley there, you get uh, into the greens and kind of brownish oranges area, area uh, where you are getting into the 90s clearly uh, during the day. So we're kind of in a sweet spot there in uh, Monterey County. Another thing that really defines our area are the winds. So you can literally set your watch every single day um, by when the winds start to come down the valley and they come screaming down the valley about 25 to 30 miles an hour. And what's important there is that grapevines don't like to lose moisture. So they have stomata and you can think of stomata like the pores in your skin. Um, when the winds come by, those stomata close up, and when they close up, photosynthesis stops. So why is that important? Well, basically, it extends your growing season. So we are very fortunate to have one of the longest, if not potentially, the longest growing season of any wine growing region in California. Our grapevines will start budding out in late February but we're not picking Chardonnay or Riesling there until sometime mid-September, October, and even into November. So there's a word called hang time. Uh, hang time is all about how long you can keep, keep your grapes on the vine. And generally, the longer you can keep them on, the more hang time you have, the more flavorful your wines will be. So speaking of wines, why don't we jump to our first wine of this evening? And uh, thank you, Josh. Um, that is going to be our J. Lore Riverstone Chardonnay. So some of you may recognize this label. I know it uh, does pretty well there in New Hampshire. Thank all of you for, uh, for buying our wines over the years. Uh, we really appreciate that. But um, what I thought we'd do today is talk about three of our wines. Two of them you probably know, or if you don't know yet, I hope you will know soon our Riverstone Chardonnay and our Seven Oaks Cabernet. And then a little later, we'll be talking about one of our newest wines, which we call Pure Paso. But starting off with um, um, our Riverstone Chardonnay, um, if you have that with you at home, please go ahead and uh, pour it. We'll go ahead and talk about it here. So give that a nice little swirl. As you smell that, you'll be getting some nice peach and apple and pear. These are all fruits that you would expect in a nice Chardonnay. But what's also nice about Monterey County is you get some nice tropical fruit flavors. Think pineapple, guava even. And with those nice aromas, what we really work on at J.Lore is a nice balance between fruit and oak. So there are many, many different ways to make a Chardonnay. In fact, Chardonnay is one of the most flexible grapes out there. Um, it can go from very fruity and unoaked to very heavily oaked where you don't taste much of the fruit. Our style is to get a really nice balance of fruit with oak as a nice support. So is you get these nice aromas and then go ahead and give it a taste. Okay. 
you'll see how you have a lots of nice natural acidity there. Um, you're going to feel that on the sides of your tongue. That's coming from this very cool um, growing appellation. Again, doesn't much get above 80 degrees here. And conversely, it doesn't get much below 50 degrees at, at night. So very, very temperate, um, but long growing season. And so that's what really helps with that balance. Now, there are also a few other things that helps with that balance. So uh, Josh, if you could just pull up the um, next slide there. And Steve, while he's, while he's opening that, um, we do have a couple of questions that are kind of timely for what you're talking about. One of the questions is, have you noticed a change in temperature or climate change? And has that changed how you, you know, uh, either grow the grapes, produce the grapes, or when you pick them in terms of your, your growing season? Yeah, yeah. So great question. We are noticing a difference um, with climate change. Uh, for us here in California, that means things are getting a little bit warmer and we're getting a little less rain. Hence wildfires that you've probably heard about over the last few years. Um, what that does for us in Monterey County doesn't affect us too much because on the one hand, um, we're not getting that much hotter. It's down in Paso Robles where we're feeling more of the heat because that, like Napa Valley, is a, has a warm growing region. Um, but rainfall, um, yeah, uh, we had a five-year drought um, from basically 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Um, and then thankfully the rains came back in, in 17 and 18 to more normal. So it does affect the way we, we, we grow our grapes, how much foliage we have out there. So we have adapted to it, especially in Pas Robles where we start to use um, um, a netting over the vines, not to keep the birds out like we do sometimes, but this is a very fine shape netting, kind of like a ping pong table netting where it actually helps reduce the amount of solar radiation on the grape leaves. Awesome. And then the only other question that we have so far is Chardonnay, how long do you age it for? And is it uh, Asian oak barrel or stainless? Yeah, so we age all of our um, uh, Chardonnay in oak barrel, um, in fact, 100% barrel fermented and aged. In fact, we're going to have a neat little slide on that later on. Okay. All right, Josh, if you could pull up the next slide. Perfect. Okay, great. So many of you might wonder, how do you get this name Riverstone? Well, this is a um, backhoe pit. If any of you have ever been to a backhoe pit, basically it's uh, the excavator arm taking a scoop out of the soil. And in this case, you have about a six foot deep profile section. So you're seeing uh, not only a Chardonnay vine up there on top, but you're seeing all those roots going through this kind of sandy loam soil. And then what's beneath that? That is a several thousand year old riverbed. And those riverbeds have river stones, hence the name. We also affectionately call them greenfield potatoes uh, because they're literally about the size of a big russet potato. Um, but the important thing there is those rocks help provide drainage. So for us in the Arroyo Seca, we only get maybe nine, 10 inches of rain there a year. And so this sandy soil, the uh, rain and irrigation go right through and uh, get down to the soil here. And you notice the roots stop about where those river stones are because there just isn't much water holding capacity. So this allows us to dial in just how much we want to go ahead and uh, irrigate and grow that grapevine. Now to that barrel question, next please, Josh. Okay, so this is a nice little cross section of one of our barrels and we have a lot of them because we're very, very dedicated to growing, uh, making wine in that traditional French process of small oak barrels, 59 gallon oak barrels. We also use American oak and even some Hungarian oak. Um, but what you see here on my right um, is a barrel with a light behind it, and that's all Chardonnay. But you're wondering, what's that cloud there? Well, that's lees. Lees are dead yeast. And yeast obviously eat the sugar, turn it into carbon dioxide, 
alcohol, the stuff we all love, and heat. And um, in the process, as it gets to be higher and higher levels of alcohol, it becomes a toxic environment for the yeast and they just die off. So that yeast kind of floats down the bottom. The thing is, there's a lot of good flavor locked up in that, in that yeast. Uh, so what we do is we stir the, the lees, the dead yeast, on a weekly basis. We do this for over 30,000 barrels of Riverstone every single week. And that's part of what makes that Riverstone so good. So what you're seeing there is somebody, um, one of our folks, uh, stirring up the, the leaves, you see it coming up there. And Josh, if you want to push play. So that's, that's literally what we do. Um, a little bit longer than that, but we got to do that for every barrel every week. Most people don't do this, but we think it makes a big difference in the flavors. And fortunately, a lot of people seem to agree. So um, with that, we are going to leave Monterey and Chardonnay unless anybody else has any questions, Sean. Nope, we're good for there. Cool. OK, so next, please. The video is just so good, he wanted to show it twice. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I actually used to do that, Sean, a lot when I was a teenager. I actually had much bigger shoulders as a teenager than I do now. That's a lot of work. <laughs> Between... the barrels. You know, people don't think about it. You have to unrack the barrels. You have to move the barrels. You have to stir. There's a lot of work in that. So it's very, very It happy. really is. Yep. Between stirring leaves and then punching down uh, the cap for Cabernet. Oh my God. I got such a workout when I was a kid. What it did is made me into an engineer. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> so from the Royal Seco, let's now go down an hour south to the Paso Roble Savie. So the Paso Roble Savie, some people say Paso Robles. Um, I say Paso Robles just because hey, we have a lot of great Hispanic workers that work for us and out of uh, deference and respect to them. Um, I say Paso Robles and technically the name of our, our city there is El Paso de Robles, which means the Paso of the Oaks in Spanish. Um, it's a huge area, 640,000 acres, about a thousand square miles. And until, um, 2014 was actually the largest unsubdivided AVA or American Viticultural Area in California. And we were actually, along with several other great growers and vendors down there at the heart of that movement to go ahead and uh, uh, further subdivide it into 11 sub-AVAs. But hey, that's the subject of another time with all of you. This just happens to be a picture of uh, one of our vineyards in Paso Robles. And uh, then maybe at this point, let's move on to our next wine. Uh, for those of you at home, if you happen to have uh, any J. Lore Seven Oaks lying around, go ahead and, and get that pour. Um, imagine that, I happen to have some right here. Um, but this is our leading wine. We actually make over 35 wines all together, but of the 35 that we make, um, the Riverstone you just saw is our number two selling wine. And this Seven Oaks is our number one selling wine. This little guy right here. In fact, uh, we're very fortunate. This still is the number one selling Cabernet um, that is labeled with an AVA, in this case, Paso Robles, over $14 in the country. So for all of you fans, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> now, why does it sell so well? Well, we like to think, one, because we um, grow it primarily from our own vineyards. Um, as a family, we're fortunate to own about 4,000 acres of vineyards between Paso Robles, Monterey County, and Napa Valley. So we think of ourselves as growers first, winemakers second. The reason that's important is because from the quality of grapes that you start off with, you can at best go horizontally in quality or go down. You can't go up. 
you have to focus on growing the absolute best grapes. And one of the things that really intrigues me um, with my engineering background, also my economics background is what are the little things that you can do to really make a difference? And any good farmer knows this. Uh, Dad's really into this. Um, Jeff and Steve, all of us are just so, my brother Lawrence, we're all so into the details of what makes the difference. Because quite frankly, the little things you can do with grapes in terms of shading and irrigation and soils and matching your clones to your rootstock, all those things make a huge difference, more so than any other agricultural um, um, commodity out there, whether it's vegetable, or fruit, nuts, what have you. So it's great fun, um, as well as to be able to drink it. But Seven Oaks Cabernet, we call it Seven Oaks because our very first vineyard uh, had seven oak trees on it. In fact, um, this little picture behind me is um, not our Seven Oaks Vineyard, it's our original Hilltop Vineyard. And that one tree there is the lone uh, tree on, on the hilltop. Um, but the Seven Oaks Cabernet is a blend of traditionally somewhere between 75 and 80% Cabernet Sauvignon with a balance being Merlot, um, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and then we go into the, some of the Rhones like Syrah and Petit Syrah and such. So it's a wonderful blend of all different kinds of grapes led by Cabernet. Now it just so happens it's 2018 that uh, we have and that you guys have in New Hampshire right now it is a higher percentage of Cabernet. So we're now getting into the 88% Cabernet range. Uh, so this is more kind of a, a real pure Cabernet, but Steve Peck, um, who again, many years our red winemaker, now director of winemaking, when he thinks about J. Lore house style for reds, he and we think of three things, dense, soft, and never green. Now, what does that mean? Well, density, certainly. There's a lot of color there. This is a rich Cabernet, especially for the, the price. Uh, really one of the best values out there. Um, dense in its aromas, in its color. What's the soft? Because you think dense and soft, do those really go together? Well, actually they do. Soft refers to the tannin profile. Tannin management is something very, very important to us at J. Lohr because quite frankly, a lot of people can take grapes, pull everything you need in terms of color and flavor out of it, but then you can over extract tannin as well. And then you just get something that makes you go, you know, makes you pucker up with all that tannin. That's not good, that's not fun. It takes away from the enjoyment of food. We make our wines to go with food first. And also just sit back out on your patio any time of the year and just enjoy and on their own. But they've got to be food friendly. So that means tannin management. Well, we're blessed being in Paso Robles because our soils are very poor in, in Paso. And you may think, well, poor soils, that's not very good. That's not going to be a good economic investment, right? Don't you want rich soils? Mm, yeah, if you're growing lettuce or carrots or asparagus, absolutely. But for grapes, no, we want poor soils because when vines struggle to survive, what they do is they put more energy into reproduction, reproduction being grapes, than they do vegetation. So when you take a look at the vines in our vineyards, they're traditionally about two thirds the size of vines in many other parts of not only California, but other wine growing regions around the world because of these very poor soils. And we're a very dry area too, which again, like Monterey, allows us to dial in the irrigation to get exactly the flavors that we want. In this case, aromas, we're getting, you know, nice black cherry, kind of black currant and anise, but you're never going to find bell pepper or asparagus in any of our Cabernets, whether it's coming from Paso Robles in particular or from our vineyard in St. Helena in the Napa Valley, because both of these areas 
um, get warm enough during the daytime. That is easily 90, 95 degrees, even 100 uh, during the uh, middle part of the summer to bake out the methoxypyrazines. Methoxypyrazines are what give you that kind of green vegetable character. Great in your salads, terrible in your wine. If you ever find that in, in your wine, you know that maybe that came from an area where it's just too cool to properly ripen uh, the Cabernet. Like our part of Monterey, which we, uh, we, we learned back in the 70s. And part of the reason we, we came to Paso in 1987 and have never looked back. We've basically been planting grapes every single year there since. But as we taste this wine, Again, you get all this nice fruit flavor with the French and American oak that we have there. You get some really nice body. Is this gonna go great with a pot roast or a steak or what have you? But again, that tannin, either from the grapes or from yolk is not pushing you over. It's tannin management, both in growing grapes and in the cellar. So um, that in part is why um, people are so um, appreciative and we are appreciative of you for, for buying our Seven Oaks. It really, really helps us stand out there. Now, let's go back to the map here and take a look at the Paso Robles AVA to see just what makes this area so special. Okay, so uh, overall, Paso Robles AVA, as I mentioned earlier, about a thousand square miles, just huge. Um, but we did divide it up into 11 separate sub appellations here back in 2014 to help people better understand flavor profiles. And that's not to say one appellation is any better than another. What's really great is in Paso Robles, there's world class wine grown throughout the entire AVA. We happen to have uh, vineyards in five uh, of the 11 separate sub appellations. A lot of the um, kind of what we have, if you see where it says the home ranch there, that is where our Paso Robles winery is. That's where we make all of our red wines. Even our Pinot Noir and Valdigue coming down from our vineyards in Monterey, and even the Cabernet coming from our Napa Valley vineyards gets made in, in Paso. Um, but you get huge diurnal swings in, in Paso um, in July and August. Again, easy to get to be 9,500 degrees during the day. Nighttime, better get your sweaters on. It's going to drop down to 50 or even the high 40s in July and August. And you may think, whoa, 45 to 50 degree, what we would call a diurnal? Why? Well, like I said, the higher temperature ranges, make sure you don't have any of that green flavor, which takes away from your grapes. Also having a nice warm um, uh, daytime temperature gives you that nice rich fruit uh, ripeness. But it's the coolness of the night that preserves your color and your natural acidity. Now acidity, I talked about that in Chardonnay, very important. It's equally as important in any of your big reds, because otherwise, if you don't have the natural acidity, it's just all flabby. It's not that good. Well, it, it's okay. It's still wine. That's a good thing, but it's not everything it can be. And with it getting so cool during the night time, uh, the grapes start out cool in the morning. And again, it's hang time. Our vines aren't uh, growing too quickly. So we are doing the majority of our August, of, of, our, of our harvest, not in July and August, but in October is when we do the majority of our har harvest in Paso Robles for Cabernet. Merlot and Syrah a little bit before that, but Cabernet is really October primarily. Um, and then Petit Verdot even after that. Petit Verdot is at Halloween or, or sometimes even a bit later. Um, but we have these cooling influences, some coming from the um, northwest there, uh, and from the Salinas Valley, the remnants of the coolness of Monterey Bay. But we also have what you see from the lower F, from the lower left, a more direct maritime flow, a very cold Pacific maritime flow, 
um, from what we would call the Templeton Gap, which is this break in the Santa Lucia mountain range, which allows this area to cool off. So you see there are some of our other vineyards like uh, Creston and Shotwell. Those are only seven degrees south of the, or seven miles south of the home ranch, but they're about four to five degrees cooler on average than the home ranch. That, my friends, is the difference between Poyac and Pomerol. If you've been to Bordeaux, you know Poyac is all about the big cabs like Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and, and uh, Mouton Rothschild and, and so forth. Um, but then you also have um, the other bank and you have Pomerol where great Merlot is grown. The soils are a little heavier. It's about four to five degrees cooler. Hence, we uh, grow most of our Merlot now at our Creston Vineyard there in the El Pomar Appalachian. And uh, some of our slightly cooler climate Cabernet, cooler by Paso standards, in what we call the Shotwell Vineyard. And speaking of the Shotwell, let's take a look at our third wine uh, for today. And <clears throat> that is our pure Paso. Uh, uh, bottle and this just happens to be our Shotwell vineyard where uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon part of Pure Paso is coming from. So you see these beautiful rolling hills uh, throughout the area. For any of you who haven't been to Paso yet, I highly recommend you to come. It's a little bit off the beaten track, a little bit harder to get to than our friends and on the north coast, but every every um, every bit as worthwhile to to come to. So thanks, Josh. Let's uh, go back and we'll go ahead. This is our Pure Paso. And this, folks, uh, New Hampshire, very happy to introduce this to you because you are just getting this to your stores now. In fact, I think it's been in, in your top 10 volume stores for just about a week or two. Pure Paso. Why Pure Paso? Well, we call this Pure Paso. Um, it actually came out of a marketing campaign. It wasn't meant to be a wine, but um, we decided, you know what? Um, we've got something really unique in, in Paso Robles in that it's one of the few places in the world where both Bordeaux varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, Cabernet Franc do every bit as well as Rhone's, Syrah, Grenache, Morvedra. It's just a wonderful place to be. Some folks are Rhone producers, some folks are Bordeaux producers. We're both, but we lean more towards Bordeaux since we're a cab house primarily. So we've got all this great cab, but we've got some killer, absolutely killer petite Syrah as well. And some of you a few years ago may have experienced our 40th anniversary red. So we celebrated our 40th anniversary in 2014. And that vintage, we went back to our roots of um, not Cabernet, but Petit Syrah. Um, believe it or not, we had as much Petit Syrah growing in Monterey as we did Cab back in, in when we uh, started in 1974. But um, we thought these are the two things that are really, really special here. And we made this blend of roughly two thirds Cab, one third, uh, petite Syrah, and people loved it. So, you know, you can only do one 40th anniversary, so that just disappeared, and it disappeared very quickly, but we got to thinking, you know, let's bring that back, and the package is, is altogether different. If you remember the 40th anniversary, it also had gold leaf. It actually had a gold top on it, too, but um, pure Paso, because this is 100% pure Paso fruit nothing else, it's all Paso. Uh, this inaugural vintage, the 2017, is 70.5% Cabernet Sauvignon, 26.5% Petit Syrah, and then the balance there is a little bit of Petit Verdot and, and Malbec. Um, but you've got two winners here, and as we taste this wine, and for those of you who might have already had a chance <clears throat> to uh, put in your glass, again, just look at that color. That is a big boy. You don't even have to smell or taste this. You just know from the color, this is going to be a lot. So here we get that nice component of the Cabernet, that black cherry, the currant, the cassis. But 
If you've ever had our taro petite sirah, you know that's like drinking blackberry pie. That's what's coming in here in this wine too. It's providing that really nice blackberry compound character. So again, let's give it a taste. Ooh. Sorry, I can't spit that one out. <laughs> um, yeah, so it just has so much going on there. Yes, this is a big, big wine. Good for game. Good <clears throat> for that prime <clears throat> prime rib. Really serious wine, but without a super serious price. <clears throat> this is a this is a wine which, you know, retails uh, for twenty seven ninety nine. I think you guys have it on special, Sean, for. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. So fantastic price, especially in New Hampshire right now. Wow. Um, um, and as you guys all know, you get great prices there in New Hampshire. So I want to thank you guys for really doing such a good job getting the wines out there. But this is a wine that um, you can enjoy, uh, whether with great food or just all on its own. Um, it's really, really a wine that you can put away for a few years. Uh, maybe not quite as long as our Hilltop Cabernet, but easily five to seven years. You know, Hilltop, you're looking at 10 years or, or more. Um, but chances are, I don't think you're going to be able to wait five to seven years. It's, it's a fun wine. Uh, right off the bat, got a 93 out of Wine Enthusiast. So um, good value, good scores, just a fun wine. Mm -hmm. It's it's always important to, too. I, I wanted to make sure everybody recognizes Chad Gibson from the the state offices because Chad is responsible for only one other person for tasting all the wines that come into the state and selecting what comes in. And the the Paso Robles region is definitely producing some beautiful wines in the last couple of decades. So uh, kudos to your family for being one of the first there. But um, Chad, I, I'm sure you have some comments about this wine because this this Pure Paso is a great wine. So I, I absolutely love Petite Syrah. It's my original love of wine. It's one of the two varietals that I really fell in love with. And, and this is an incredible wine. You know, the balance that you get out of it with the, the flavor of the Petite Syrah balancing the Cabernet. I mean, if you have an opportunity to buy a bottle of this wine and try it, I definitely recommend it just because it's so unique and it's such a great quality product. And like Sean said, Paso Robles has really started to show what it can do for red wine. and consistently it gets high ratings out of that area and it's definitely something that i suggest everybody give a shot to all right great thank you chad appreciate it we have a couple a couple more questions for you um so speaking of paso which is definitely drier and gets warmer one of the questions is how do you handle watering the vines during a drought or just that dr those dry periods yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, so especially given the fact that unlike New Hampshire or, you know, many parts of the country for that matter, we don't get a drop of rain typically from about mid-April until Thanksgiving. So uh, it's all irrigation from groundwater. Now, what we do do is we get, you know, good 90% of our rain from sometime around Thanksgiving or just thereafter um, until early mid-April. And uh, so our ground profile gets filled up during that period. And if it turns out to be a drier winter, we'll go ahead and get more um, uh, water into the ground during that time to get the roots to chase that water down. Because as those roots go down, we become more resilient to the summer heat spells. If it gets over 100, 105 degrees, that can be pretty brutal on vines, just like it's brutal on all of us. The only thing is we don't get the uh, humidity that most parts of the country do. It's, it's a dry heat. Uh, it's a little bit like being in a sauna, but a good sauna, a beautiful sauna and uh, such. But um, yeah, so we'll irrigate. But, you know, we've learned a lot in the last uh, 10, 12 years. We used to irrigate on a weekly basis with the way we do longer irrigation sets and not as frequently now. Those roots have chased down, believe it or not, Sometimes we'll go for two to two and a half months during the summer and not irrigate one drop. So 
we've learned how to be more resilient, make even better grapes and wines, and use less water in the process. Thank you. And uh, we, just so you know, we, I'm seeing the comments and we have a ton of fans on for JLOR. So you, you have a lot of people mentioning wines that we don't carry necessarily <laughs> today, like October Night and some of the other ones. So they're very, very popular wines that they're talking about. And we even have a few friends from uh, north of New Hampshire, which is hard to believe, but from Canada who are asking about the wines as well. So uh, reaching across a few continents here or countries at least. But um, we do have one other question. They're interested, uh, Steve would like to know, do you make any ports? Do we make ports? I would love to say we make ports, but you know, technically you can't make port in the United States. <laughs> um, there, there's this little thing, even though lots of people do, and I'll call it port, but technically you know how champagne can only be grown in Champagne, France, or France. Um, same thing, you can only make a port in Portugal. But if we're talking about that style of, of wine, we don't make it from a red wine like they do in Portugal. We do have something that if you're into that kind of sweeter mouth profile, but exploding with flavors, we have something called our j -Lore Late Harvest Riesling. So that comes from our vineyards up in Monterey County in the Arroyo Seco. And you know how I was talking about, we typically pick Riesling in November. Well, we'll pick the part that has Botrytis, which is a fungus which grows on the grapes. And believe me, if you ever saw it, you, you'd never want to drink it. But the French actually are so revered of this, they call it the noble rot. It's what Sauterne is all about. So this fungus actually grows on the skin of the grapes and it dehydrates the grapes. It also adds more flavor to the grapes. So it's like apricot, um, honey, pineapple on steroids. And so we make this late harvest Riesling, which is typically about 12 to 13% Riesling. Since you guys are in New Hampshire and hey, Canadians too, welcome. You guys are familiar with, with Ice Fine. Think Ice Fine. It's a lot like Ice Fine and it's very, very special. So I, I look for that. We've, we have had a few people inquire about pricing and some of the products. And so Chad, I think it put in the chat, but for all our friends over on Facebook, I also want to make sure we mention that in January, it is our sale, our customer appreciation sale. So it's a cheers to you sale. And that sale is 15% off all wines uh, for 12 or model, more bottles in the 375 and the 750 sizes. So it's a great time. I mean, obviously it's already great prices for the JLR products, but a wonderful time to actually pick up a, a slew of them. And uh, anybody who wants to have some fun with wine certainly knows buy several of the same vintage and each year over several years, go ahead and open those wines and see how they are. I'm enjoying them over time. And it is worth noting also that on Steve's uh, website with JLOR, they, they have a very interesting chart for consumers, which gives recommendations in terms of when you should uh, drink a wine, right? So if you buy a wine, what vintage it is and how long to store it and then how long to, uh, and then when you should start enjoying it. It's a great, great resource. And um, also there's several different recipes on the website as well. Um, and some of these great reds that we've been trying tonight can certainly I go with the nice London broil that I was reading about today on your website, which made me very hungry. So <laughs> kudos for putting those out there. That's wonderful. Um, I also want to mention we, as everybody knows, we've been using Scavify, which is scavenger hunt uh, promotion as part of this 90 day event. And we have a code word for everybody tonight. And that code word is Steve. So thank you, Steve. Um, and with Steve, you can enter that into uh, your Scavify and you'll be able to get closer to more points in promotions for everybody that's doing that. Um, Steve, these have been gr great wines and, and I hope everybody gets excited about the Pure Paso because um, I know it's been in a couple restaurants very selectively in New Hampshire prior to the full release. And, and now that's in our top 10 stores, it's a great opportunity for people to really try a wonderful wine. And, and it stands out. I think J. Lors are always a great bottle. You, you recognize the label and with the new label or the new style of the bottle for the Paso, it's, it's nice to bring that to somebody's house when you're allowed to go to somebody's house. Um, <laughs> certainly true. always a nice gift and always nice to drink at home too, so. You bet. We have a couple of questions that you, I think you have touched on. Somebody did ask about the AVAs in Paso Robles, which I think you said they had, originally it was one, but then they split it into 11, I think you said. That's right. And, uh, and you're operating in, I think you said seven of those Appalachians, right? Yeah, five. Yeah, five. we, um, Yep, we own vineyards in five of the sub Appalachians. And we actually, since we do buy grapes from other top growers as well, 
um, we actually buy grapes from 10 of the 11 sub appellations. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions right now, but just lots of kudos. Just, you know, the New Hampshire people are definitely uh, giving you thumbs up for all of the products and they're asking Chad to bring several back. So I think Chad has his <laughs> marching orders after today. <laughs> He's going to be great. Calling, uh, <laughs> calling to talk about that. Um, That's great. Anything else you'd like to share with us tonight, Steve? Yeah, actually, you know, I'd be happy if we could, Sean, to talk a little bit about sustainability. Let's do it. Absolutely. Oh. Okay, cool, because sustainability is something that's very, very important to our family. Um, you know, Dad grew up on this farm in South Dakota, and he actually grew up um, growing grain organically because, in part, they didn't really have many chemicals back then. Um, but even when we got started um, in Monterey, you know, we were one of the first to use drip irrigation uh, there in the 70s. And we've always looked at ways to um, lower use of resources, whether it's water or um, energy or what have you. And um, sustainability has, has been very important to me personally as well. I actually put together our uh, sustainability committee at JLOR. There are 16 of us that get together on a regular basis to look at things we can do in both the vineyards and winery to be ever more sustainable. And um, the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, which is uh, a wonderful group. I'm actually on the board of it and was chairman of it for a few years as well. When we think of uh, sustainability, we think of the three E's of sustainability, and those would be environmentally sound, economically feasible, and socially equitable. Okay, so um, environmental. Most people, when you think of sustainable, that's what you think about, the environmental uh, aspect. Um, and certainly organic uh, or biodynamic, you're talking about environment there. But the nice thing about sustainability is it's the intersection. It's the intersection of those three circles right there in the middle, where you not only take into account environment, but you take into account social equity, which is all about, hey, how do you treat your employees? How do you take care of your community? What do you do for others? You know, for instance, for us, we um, contribute to about, oh gosh, it's upwards of 400 charities a year probably the biggest one of which is National Breast Cancer Foundation because we lost mom, unfortunately, to National Breast Cancer. But uh, that's part of social equity. Um, and then the thing you probably won't be thinking about is economically feasible, but hey, that's so important because if you can't make a buck doing whatever you're doing, yeah, you're not gonna be able to do it too long. So it's trying to get all three of these together, which are so important. And then if we take a look at the next slide, um, we are very proud to just this past year, uh, get the Green Medal Leader Award. Um, this goes, there are roughly 4,500 wineries here and in California, about another 4,500 in the other 49 states, about 9,000 wineries around the country. But out of the 4,500 here in California, one winery each year gets, a, it gets an award um, called the Green Medal Leader Award. And it is for the one winery which does the best at getting these three E's all put together in their um, uh, business, whether it's in grape growing, winemaking, and of course, we do both. Um, there are also other green medals given um, to some other great um, wineries and vineyards as well for basically the three E's, but uh, we were very fortunate this past year. And I really kind of give hats off to our, our team. Um, not only the, the 16 on our sustainability team, but quite frankly, all 260 of us between the winery and the vineyards for really making sustainability part of their everyday um, uh, MO. So with that, um, thank you and happy to answer any other questions, uh, Sean. We have, we have a couple more, Steve. So one person is asking, and, and I see it in the images, but I'm assuming uh, they'd like to know if you are using solar at your different uh, vineyards. Oh, wow. You bet. Um, in fact, um, uh, we have the largest solar tracking array of any winery in North America. 
And um, so <clears throat> by solar tracking array, um, so again, this goes back to my civil engineering um, uh, student days at Stanford back in the 80s. Okay, I've just dated myself, but there we go. Um, and back then I had a professor who wrote this awesome book. It was called Other Homes and Garbage. And um, it was all about proper placement of homes, hence my home building career as well. But also it got into photovoltaics. And quite frankly, in the early 80s, photovoltaics were a nice theory but it didn't work economically. It wasn't sustainable. And, um, but as the uh, photovoltaic industry continued to progress over the years, and then we were holding an energy savings workshop at our winery in 2007. And I just got to thinking, you know, we get 320 days of sunshine per year in Paso. It's easily 9,500 degrees during the day in the summertime. And we have a lot of barrels and a lot of tanks to keep cool. What better place than Paso to do solar? Quite frankly, anywhere in California uh, is, is a good place to do solar. And anywhere really that you can, please do solar. It's, it's so, so important to use renewable resources. But we put in uh, a tracking race. So that means that in the morning when the sun is in the east, the, um, the um, array is facing this. And then as the sun goes throughout its path during the day, the solar panels track the sun so that they facing west in the afternoon. It's about 15% more efficient than just your traditional fixed array. But for us, that means we can make all of our red wine and uh, serve our tasting room with about 85% plus or minus solar power. It's, um, and if you take a look at the sustainability equation, that means that our four acres or three football fields of solar is uh, the equivalent of not driving a car 92 million miles in terms of the CO2 that would come out of that tailpipe or it's the equivalent of um, planting a 512 acre forest. Very important for those of you in the Northeast because you're blessed with so many forests. It's taking all that CO2 out of the air uh, and such. So yeah, yeah, we, we do happen to have some solar, not only in Paso, but we even have uh, more solar up in Monterey. Great. It's, I have to say, I'm always impressed. And I know that when, when you talk to a lot of vineyard owners and wineries that they they refer to themselves as farmers and you mentioned that obviously earlier with your dad and everything and it's always impressive to see them do so much with so little right and be so smart when they do um whether it's the netting that you talked about or letting foliage grow so it shields the grapes or whether it's using sheep in the meadow it's it's just it's very impressive to see how you've gotten very wise to using um natural resources i'll say to, to protect everything it's, it's great to see um you had mentioned earlier and i did want to touch on it um about your commitment in terms of your your um, social commitment and the breast cancer involvement. And I did notice in your site, and I thought it looked great, that you have a number of events, usually in October, around Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, which hopefully by October, everybody will be traveling and they'll be able to take some uh, time away and um, go and visit you. And Paso Robles is amazing, so certainly do that. Um, but joining you for some of those special events would be a great experience, I'm sure. Um, and also, of course, visiting some of your tasting rooms and seeing all the wines that you have there that, as well. So mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask Chad. So Chad, I, I believe I saw you respond to somebody online that we got introduced to Jay Lore through one of the New Hampshire Power Buy programs. And that's a pretty unique program for New Hampshire. Uh, it would be great if you could share a little bit of that information right now with us. Yeah, so the uh, the Power Buy program offers uh, incredible savings on some really special wines. And the whole heart and soul of the program is to really um, introduce people to you know a wine like Jaylor that they may not normally be able to try or haven't heard of before. And that's really what the Power Buy program is all about: is so people can try different varietals in different vineyards and um, find ones that they really like and really be able to expand their their wine journey through it. And I saw earlier, Steve, and I may get this wrong. I thought I saw somebody ask about another wine. Uh, yeah, I just saw somebody ask about our Valdicchia. Is that Valdicchia. what you were thinking? I saw that. And then you also yep. had one, uh, St. Montclair, was it? 
Oh, the Sam McCare. Oh my gosh, you've got you've got smart people on here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought you might want to mention a couple of things about those wines for us. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Sam McCare. Um, who can name the Bordeaux grapes? Okay. Now most of us think of five, right? Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot. Most people get that. Beyond that, if you're pretty good about um, uh, Bordeaux grapes, you know that there's Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Cabernet Franc, all which are very, very important part of our um, vineyards, our blending, our cuvee series, our luxury Bordeaux blends are based on all of those uh, there. But there are actually eight grapes uh, from, uh, from Bordeaux. And the rarest one of them all is Saint Macaire. They're actually just a few hectares or a few acres left in all of Bordeaux. They're only, well, maybe 50 acres or so in California, and we just happen to have about six of them. And uh, the San Macaire is one of our newest plantings. We just planted it a few years ago. It's uh, going into our uh, signature uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which um, uh, a couple years ago, got an award uh, for at the um, um, Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show, one of the most major international wine shows each year. Uh, 3,400 of the world's top wines from 38 countries and our signature Cabernet first took best Cabernet and then went on to win best red and then in rodeo fashion, best of show. Um, well, this current um, vintage of the um, signature Cabernet has some Saint Macaire in it. It's a really big dark grape, um, inky uh, grape. Um, think Petit Syrah, even darker, if you can imagine. So Chad, there you go. It's, it's your next, uh, next you love. <laughs> But it's, uh, it provides some really, really intense, uh, not only blackberry, um, but also gets a little into the tobacco area. Uh, it's a major, major wine. Um, we're doing blending right now. We also just introduced uh, a standalone varietal, which is done in, in small amounts, but through the winery directly. And then the flip side of that on the red, Actually, coincidentally, since one of your uh, listeners asked, is Valdiguier, or Valdiguier, as some people call it, but if you want to say it correctly, it's Valdiguier. And Valdiguier, think Gamay Beaujolais. We used to make, back in the 70s and 80s, something we called Monterey Gamay. It was technically Napa Gamay, but we called it Monterey Gamay since we were planting it in our vineyards in, in Monterey. The French, though, start saying, mm -mm -mm, no, you, you can't use that name. Um, and so we actually did some uh, tests and we found out it's a very, very rare clone of Gamay called Valdiguier. It's uh, just found really in the Languedoc Roussillon region of uh, France. And there are just a handful of us growers in California that, that, that make it, but it's a, literally a cult wine. Um, for all of you who are really white wine drinkers, but might want to make that crossover, this is the wine to try. It, when you taste it, and by all means, put in the fridge, you know, for 20, 30 minutes before you do, because it's really nice with a nice little chill to it. A little different from most other, other reds, um, but cranberries, raspberries, most beautiful magenta uh, rim on it, but really, really low tannin. And that's why everybody loves it. It's the perfect Thanksgiving wine with turkey and cranberry sauce. It's a great springtime picnic wine. It's a nice quaffable summertime wine along with rosé and stuff. It actually is one of those nice light wines and very affordable that works any time of the year. And, and somebody did ask, is the St. Macaire um, something you're going to continue to produce? Yes, yes, we love Santa Care. Um, so we will continue to produce it um, as a standalone variety. It sold out very quickly when we, um, when we brought it out here, but it'll be a standalone variety, varietal, as well as um, a blend for some of our higher end reds. Nice. And I, I will recognize Laura, who is on our 
um, viewing list tonight. She has obviously gone to your website and she says, as a breast cancer survivor, I applaud you. And she uh, saw your hope kit and she thinks it's absolutely fantastic. So. Oh, great. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate that. Uh, that's that's it for our presentation tonight, Steve. But it's been a pleasure having you on. And, and anytime we have somebody from JLore, we always learn so much and love talking about your products because they're great to taste. Oh, well, thank you, Sean and, and Chad. It's great to be with you. And also want to just give a shout out to uh, Josh Baldovino, part of our marketing department. Thanks for being my right hand man there, Josh, tonight. And I also want to give a shout out to Shauna Troy, who is uh, one of you um, from New Hampshire. She's a native of New Hampshire, lives in Portsmouth. She is our uh, Northeast Regional Manager there and works very closely with uh, the uh, commission there. And uh, as well as the folks up in Maine, uh, in Vermont, if any of you are listening there. And for all you Canadians, thanks again. You know, we really appreciate all of you joining too. Uh, thank you for all your support up, up North there. We, we really appreciate that. But you know, Anytime you guys have questions, feel free to, to reach out. Um, you know, I'm slore at jlore.com. Uh, we're always happy to share uh, our knowledge, our passion for growing grapes and making wine. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. As long as you keep right. making great wines, we'll keep selling them to our consumers and making everybody over in New Hampshire happy. So we appreciate it. Oh, great. Have a great night, everybody. And remember, we have about uh, only 15 days left in our 90 days around the world. So Caroline, myself, Chad, Lisa, everybody will be joining in for a few more nights of fun. And uh, make sure you check out 90daysaroundtheworld.com to see those upcoming events. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Take care, everyone.